there's a difference between saying you have to eat this, you know, mm. unless you eat this, then you can't have this, mm-hmm. you know, and battling with them versus let's try this food. You never know if you're going to like it today. You may not like it and that's all right. And giving them that out takes away that pressure. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode number 332. Today, we're talking about in the resolution series, resolving to eat nutritiously with Dr. Organic Mommy, Natasha Beck. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you can give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of Mindful Parenting, and I'm the author of the best-selling book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Hey, welcome. I am so glad you are here today. Hey, listen, if you haven't done this yet, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And you know, if you get any value at all from this podcast, please do me a favor and go over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and review. It helps the podcast grow more. It really it takes like 60 seconds and I greatly, greatly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. I'm so excited for you to be here today because in just a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Dr. Natasha Beck. She's a parenting expert and the founder of Dr. Organic Mommy, an online resource focused on parenting, pregnancy, and non-toxic living. And I'm so excited for you to join this conversation today because we are going to be talking about nutrition and how to how important it is and how to make it easier, right? Like let's the whole idea in this resolution series is to make it easier to give you tips and tricks. So if you are lazy and not super psyched about cooking like I am, you can have more nutritious meals for your kids because it's so, so important. It is so much fun to talk to Dr. Natasha and a really cool thing for Mindful Parenting members. She is going to be an expert guest that comes and talks to the Lifetime members and answers all their questions. So If you would like to talk to Dr. Natasha in person, this is a great opportunity. If you are a member and if you want to learn more about the membership, get on the wait list. Super easy. Just go to mindfulparentingcourse.com. You'll get on the wait list. We'll let you know more about the the membership. You know, we have lifetime options and then we also have a self-study option that's more affordable. We also give out scholarships too. So there's lots of great ways to get involved and get engaged and get that support you need. Just go to mindfulparentingcourse.com and sign up for the waitlist, and we'll send you all the information you need and get let you know when the doors open again. All right. I, I think that's enough to, to tell you about beforehand. Join me at the table as I talk to Dr. Natasha Beck. I would love for you to like give people your creds so they know what, what an expert and pro we're talking to about nutrition and kids habits today. So can you, can you okay. list off your creds for us, please? Sure. So I have a doctorate in pediatric neuropsychology. I also have a master's in child and family health. Um, and I am also certified in leadership education, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. I was also formally diagnosed with reading disorder, which used to be known as dyslexia and ADHD, and I have three children out of my own and pregnant with my fourth. You're pregnant right now. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> How? How far yeah. along are you? Uh, about 21, 22 weeks. Oh, congratulations. Oh my gosh. You. Are you feeling okay? I'm nauseated here and there, but it's coming along. Oh my God. This might be the perfect place to start because when I was pregnant with my daughters, I was, I was nauseated and like the food that I wanted first, the food I wanted was like a sliced Turkey sandwich because I'd been mostly vegetarian for years and I had allowed myself to start to eat some meat ethically, but I hadn't yet eaten sliced Turkey in like a decade. And so I was pregnant. I was like, oh my God, I gave myself permission to eat the turkey sandwich. And it was like the best turkey sandwich. I ate it like every day for three weeks, but it was the turkey sandwich, which I understand a lot because of the protein and all that. But, um, but then I really also wanted the, 
um, for local people, you'll know only the hers cheese puffs. <laughs> And I would like be teaching like a yoga class. And sometimes I, there was, it was definitely a distinct moment where I had to like wipe the like orange dust off my like black yoga pants before I went and, and off your my fingers, yoga yes. class. <laughs> That's great. So I don't know. I'm all about paying attention to your body and really, you know, listening to your cues, teaching your kids to listen, uh, to listen to their body, because that's really what it's all about when eating you know, healthy and, and trying to figure out, well, these foods are the foods that help us grow. And these foods that are foods that don't help us grow as much, you know? And so when you teach your children to pay attention to their body, they're more aware of what's going on and how they're feeling. And it's the same thing when you're pregnant, you know, if you were craving Turkey, I have actually been craving meat this pregnancy. I used to be vegan. <laughs> um, and I think it's because my body used to be, uh, I was anemic before and I couldn't get my levels up. I constantly had to supplement and I'm feeling so much better during this pregnancy. I'm sourcing from, you know, regenerative farms uh, that where the animals are pasture raised, they, you know, are it's sourced ethically. And, you know, I felt a lot better. So it's really all about listening to your body. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It, it comes back to that body, body awareness and, and what sort of starts to feel good. And actually, I mean, I have all these other questions I want to ask you about speaking of body awareness and like kind of paying attention to what feels good. We, we you know, um, one of our daughters is like, I I'm noticing, you know, a lot of humans have a tendency to use food as like a comfort source and things like that. And I'm noticing her, doing that, you know, in, in pre-adolescence as like, uh, just like she makes herself mac and cheese and she eats like a lot of that mac and cheese. And, and we're worried about her getting enough sort of protein. Maybe she's not getting satisfied from, cause she doesn't want to eat meat. Right. Ethically. Um, what would you, how, I mean, for, how do you encourage kids to pay attention to their bodies. I mean, at a younger age, I, I really, you know, it, it seemed very clear and obvious on how to do that. And now at this age, I, I feel a little less clear and obvious on how to do that because it's a sensitive age too. Sure. It is a sensitive age and it's, a, it's very different this time in society because we've got social media, which didn't exist when we were younger and there's a lot more pressure. And, you know, especially with, you know, with, girls and boys, you know, they're seeing, you know, all the filters on social media and that really starts to mess with their self-confidence, their, like their internal image. And so you want to talk to your teens and have conversations with them, just like you do with your younger children, but you're going to tailor it a different way where it's not as, um, condescending, I would say. And so sitting with them and saying, it's like, I'm like asking, all right, I see that you're eating some mac and cheese. Let's figure out, should we add some veggies to it? Like, how can we kind of up the nutritional content? You know, I get it. It's a feel good food. Is there anything else that's going on? You know, I know right now, like when I was a teenager, and I think it's really important to share stories mm -hmm. from your past. When I was a teenager, this is what I felt. I have no idea if this is what you're feeling or not. Only you can tell me, but just know that I'm always here if you ever want to talk. Mm -hmm. It's having that respectful relationship and that open dialogue where they feel safe to express their emotions, where you're not trying to fix them. I think mm -hmm. that's the biggest point where parents, especially today, are constantly trying to fix their kids. Mm -hmm. Kids don't want to be fixed. They don't want to be told, like, here's the solution. They just want to have someone to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And so when you're just there to listen, they feel safe to tell you, I just want you to sit with yeah. me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important where you can have those conversations, you know, you can either, you know, talk about journaling or having, you know, gratitude moments, figuring out self-care, whether or not you guys do it together or separate. And there's different ways to approach that, you know, instead of going to the point where we're just filling our stomachs, you know, indefinitely with food where we're, we're not actually hungry. And so that's where it comes back to really paying attention to those body cues and teaching your kids to be self-aware of what they're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I I know it's, it, it's can still be like so challenging too. It's like, and, and as well as like giving that, you know, 
yeah, walking that line well, but let's, let's dive back into like, one of the things I was really interested to talk to you about was diet and lifestyle, but diet like re- can affect behavior and it can, can affect conditions like ADHD and autism. And I just love to learn a little bit more about that in general, like how, how, what, how is diet affecting these things? Sure. So luckily more and more uh, health professionals are becoming aware of this. When I first noticed this over a decade ago was when I was working in clinics, you know, in the hospital and having children come in when I was testing them and they would bring in, you know, hamburgers or breakfast burritos and sodas. And they were having such extreme difficulty even sitting down with me to just for five minutes. And these were older children like 10 year olds where you expect them to be able to sit for longer periods of time. And so I started really diving into that research. And there's so as the biggest culprit is sugar, to be honest, mm-hmm. sugar is hidden in everything. And, you know, right now, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends zero sugar for under age two. But then all of a sudden, it jumps from two to 18, you're allowed 24 grams of sugar. But that's a big range because two to eighteen is a huge range. Huge like there's range. a big a difference between it. compared to a seventeen-year-old, right? <laughs> that's crazy. Um, so actually, uh, Dr. Michael Garan and uh, Dr. Emily Ventura wrote this book called Sugar Proof, and they laid out a great table um, showcasing you what type, the amount of sugar for each age, and kind of how it builds up. Um, but the problem comes where we're in like kids today are eating so much sugar, it's hidden in everything. Parents have no idea. They think, oh, I'm giving my kids a glass of orange juice. I've got a healthy muffin. I've got some yogurt for breakfast. But all in all, you've uh, you've basically had your sugar for the day. Yeah. So the problem comes where it's affecting cognition. It's affecting attention. It's affecting mood. Kids are often very irritable from it. You know, kids are ending up with fatty liver disease. They're associating it now with more with Alzheimer's disease later in life. Wow. So there's a ton of research going on around sugar. Sugar is going to be the new hot topic that everybody's going to be talking about and what's really impacting our children today. So what I'm getting from you saying that is like, as best we can, if you were a parent of little kids, keep your kids away from sugar as as best you can. Like, so I am, I'm totally justified in giving my children the fruit sweetened, uh, pear muffin that they got for their first one-year-old birthday party with cream cheese on top while everybody else got a chocolate tort. I love it. I love it. I think there's, but there's, there's balance, right? So you've got to look at sugar. There's refined sugar and unrefined sugar. So unrefined mm-hmm. sugars, you're got, you get your honey, your maple syrup, your dates, you know, apples, pears, but actual apples and pears. I'm not talking about like the juice that's sweetened with apple juice, concentrate, grape juice, concentrate, those are like boiled down and so processed where none of the fiber is there. And so you've got these huge insulin spikes and that's really affecting our kids' behavior. When you wonder why aren't they sleeping? Why are they having such emotional outbursts that are so different from typically what they typically have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sugar is the culprit behind it. So you wanna stick with your unrefined sugars and especially I prefer things like dates to sweeten things because you have that fiber. If you're going to eat fruit, I'd rather you have the whole fruit and not have the juice, for example, because then you have the fiber and it slows down that huge spike of insulin that you're going to get that's going to really wire you and impact your behavior. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. We are supported by Forever Well. Forever Well offers a variety of health and wellness products through a partnership with fitness legend and America's personal trainer, Tony Little. They have delicious gummies, fast acting pain, freeze cream, and age defying topical and easy to swallow capsules. I'm loving the Forever Well gummies. They're delicious bite-sized gummies. They're formulated with the finest ingredients to help promote better health and wellness. You can try them on their own, or use them together to create a well-rounded daily health routine. They have sleep well gummies for a better night's sleep, energy well to give you the energy you need, focus well for improving your focus, cognitive function, and your energy. And I love the immune well gummies that support a stronger immune system 
with quality ingredients formulated into a really delicious gummy. Relieve Well soothes aches and pains and sore muscles and joints with the cooling, fast-acting, and long-lasting relief of Relieve Well Pain Freeze. And Age Well helps to revitalize your skin and reduce the appearance of aging with hydrating blend of ingredients. Right now, you can be forever well and learn more at beforeverwell.com. And Mindful Mama listeners can get a free 12-count immunity or energy gummies with any purchase of $19 and over with the code MAMA12. So that's getting 12 counts of immunity or energy gummies for free. Just use the code MAMA12, M-A-M-A-12, and you can do that at beforeverwell.com. That's B E. F-O-R-E-V-E-R-W-E-L-L dot com. Be forever well with the coupon code MAMA12. All right. So now from my perspective as a mom of a preteen and a mm-hmm. teen, yeah. I can see that like we have so much control over kids when uh, what they eat when they're little. I mean, you know, I remember going into the bank and being like with my child, that was back in the days when you actually went into the bank (laughs) and, and they would like try to give her a lollipop and I'd be like, stop. No, you know, do you have any stickers? Stop you sugar pushers. And now it's a different world. You know, it's like, they're, they're at their friend's house. They're at scout meetings. They're at all these different things. They're at school, all these things happen. So what I'm kind of hoping for. So what, what I'm just sort of wondering from you is that, you know, a lot of us, we want to, we want to make sure our kids have like a really healthy diet when they're little. But what I'm imagining is that it it has to be kind of a lifestyle that everybody is adopting because, you know, they're going to absorb the lifestyle of the family. And I also wonder about like, they, uh, they go to friends and they think I'm crazy. Cause I never buy juice. Like we never had juice in my house. And, yeah. and they, they, they complain about it. They tell me I'm terrible, like, you know, because I don't buy juice. What are some of the, what did, what are we aiming for sort of overall? I mean, I guess there are kind of like different levels of nutrient, uh, nutrition, you know, consciousness in, in different places, but and where do we, we start? Have, help us, help us. Tips? Okay. So I think going back, it's starting in the home where yes, you're correct. It's got to have everybody on the same page where we're all adopting the same type of lifestyle. So, you know, having both parents or caregivers, everybody on the same page about it. And what you have in your home is what your children are going to be exposed to. Now it's also about education. So that's the modeling piece. And then there's also the education piece. You don't want to restrict your kids because inevitably, like you're saying, when they're older, they're going to friends' houses, they're going to be exposed to these things, and you don't want them to be like, I never had this at my house. I'm going to go off the deep end and eat everything in sight that I'm like I'm seeing out there. Oh, you know? I have a great story for that. Can I interject yes, here with please. that? <laughs> I have a friend who is very crunchy mama, and she only gave her daughter unsweetened chocolate, uh, when she was little at home, <laughs> like completely unsweetened chocolate. And so her daughter then tried like milk chocolate at somebody's house and was like, Oh my gosh, like, is this the same thing? And this is amazing. And so her daughter now loves and is obsessed with milk chocolate and white chocolate, Yeah, but it's kind of funny. Like my daughter's like, we had dark chocolate at home, not completely unsweetened chocolate, but they do like dark chocolate now. Like they're yeah. They're good with like dark, pretty, pretty low sugar chocolate, but it was, it's kind of funny that I can't, I can't imagine like eating unsweetened chocolate. It sounds horrible. It's quite <laughs> bitter and I definitely have it in my home, but I use it for baking, but I add other types of unrefined sugars to it. Uh, but that's exactly right. So they can go off the deep end. And so you don't want to be too strict. What you want to do is after you're modeling, you're educating. And so letting them know, hey, let's look at what's on the package. Let's look at the ingredient list. Always read your labels. And I teach my kids this from a very young age so that when they get older, they're going to turn that package around and look what they're actually eating and putting into their body. Are these artificial dyes? That's something I always recommend to stay away from. Artificial dyes and preservatives, that really impacts kids, especially kids who have ADHD. I personally notice the difference because I have ADHD. Oh, really? You know, it's fascinating. We did a We did a trip to um, Ireland when our, when our girls were in 2016 and 
we gave them some euros like at the airport to like go buy whatever you want. It's like, uh, we're, we're about to leave. And they came back with a big package of um, Starburst mm-hmm. candies. Yeah. And we were amazed to look at them because they're pale. They had no colors. Like the yellow the was just com- there. completely white. There, there was no red. Everything was very, very pale colored. And it was be- it's because the EU bans the certain well, colors, artificial dyes, yeah. these There's artificial about- dyes that our country did, you know, so just because it's out there does not mean it's really something your bot you want in your kids' bodies. Yeah. I mean, there's about nine artificial dyes that our country has um, that uh, we approve of in the United States that other countries ban out there. And so I teach our kids, let's look for a better alternative. There are now at least they're, they're selling, you know, they're listening to consumers, uh, the companies, and they're making products without those artificial dyes. They're making products without, um, you know, less with less sugar, you know, adding more, you know, unrefined sugar. They're making products that, you know, are organic. So they're not sprayed with glyphosate, that toxin, you know, that can impact our gut. And so there are alternatives. And so you just want to provide those alternatives for your kids. So, Mm. you know, um, for example, like during the holidays, you know, during Halloween and Christmas where, you know, sugar consumption goes up. Um, at least I think by 33% um, during your whole year, it's be, you've got to pay attention to what you're giving your kids and try to monitor that. And that's really when you're starting to, you know, learn more things in school, you know, between I'd say October and December, and it's the beginning of the year, you want to pay attention to your child's sugar, sugar consumption. So after you're modeling, now you're educating and you're letting them know, all right, there are some foods that help us grow. And there are foods that don't, don't help us grow as much. We want to try and eat the foods that help us grow. But my saying is, if you're going to eat, eat the foods that don't help you grow, eat the good stuff. So yeah. what do I mean by that? Yeah, I'd yeah. rather what? you eat like a homemade cookie or a muffin that has whole food ingredients rather than, you know, a piece of candy that has artificial dyes. So you just mm-hmm. want to balance that. So when you're talking to your teenagers, especially like, just let them know, like, this might be a better alternative and you actually might feel better. It's not normal to feel bloated. A lot of these products that were, especially these packaged products, they're going to make you feel bloated. They're going to make you feel a little bit weighed down, heavy, slower, a little bit, you know, it's going to be harder to pay attention. You're going to feel a little bit more irritable. So this is really why I want to teach our kids and yourself to pay attention to exactly how you're feeling after you eat it and a little bit later too. So they're aware of it. So what about like, where are you draw holding boundaries on some of these things? Cause you know, they're gonna like go to the Easter party and they're going to get, you know, they're going to go to the birthday party and come home with a big bag of, um, candies and they're gonna, you know, all of these things are going to happen. Like they're going to do yeah. Easter egg hunt. They're going to do all this stuff. So where, oh, where is a healthy place to draw the line where a parent who's concerned about nutrition and having their kids eat, eat good foods and yeah. not be feel or act psychotic because of sugar. Um, where do you, draw you know, the line? where do you, where do you, where, where personally, where do you do that? You know, yeah. I mean, when your kids do that kind of thing. So I first always load them up before we go to any event with healthy food. So whether it's a huge snack platter or um, a really a veggie loaded smoothie, and they know exactly what's in that smoothie um, so that they're really full before they go to that event, you know? And so they pay attention to their body on more satiated. I actually want to go play. I want to enjoy the event. Events aren't always about the candy and you know, the baked goods and everything else. It's about fun and community and playing because that's what, you know, kids all, that, that's what kids do is play. Um, even your teenagers, they wanna talk to their friends and hang out, you know? But if you can, if, you're, if they're not hungry and they're going to an event, it's, it's the same thing if you go grocery shopping. I always tell mm-hmm. people, don't go to the grocery store if you're hungry, worst idea ever, um, because you're just gonna get things that you wouldn't normally get. Uh, because you're hungry and you're not really paying attention to everything else that's on those labels because you're just starving. Um, And so you really want to pay attention to those satiation cues. And it's the same thing when, you know, when you're looking at, uh, do you want to eat right now? 
well, how full are you? You don't want to get to the point where you're so full that you're feeling uncomfortable. You want to get to the point where you're feeling like, all right, I've had enough. I'm like, I could have probably eat a little bit more, but I'm all right. That's mm-hmm. kind of where you want to stop. You don't want to get to the point where you're just like so consumed with food. Now, you fill them up before you get there. And then you talk to them about if you're going to have food, the foods that don't help you grow or foods that help you grow either or you mm-hmm. have to make sure you sit down. I often mm-hmm. see kids running around eating food and it's a choking hazard. And I explain my reasoning for wanting them to sit down. It's my job to A, make sure you're safe, B, make sure your body grows and your mind, and C, make sure you're a kind person. Those are my three rules. And mm-hmm. most everything kind of falls under, uh, under those categories. So you can always relate back to that. So when they're at these events, they have to sit down so that you're safe and you don't choke. Most kids don't actually want to sit down when they see all their friends playing. So they'll say, all right, I'll eat later. And honestly, most of the time they just forget about it. Some kids don't and they want to enjoy the slice of pizza or, you know, the red vines or whatever they have there. And that's fine with me. And I let my kids do that. You know, for the younger kids, I try to bring alternatives. So once they're younger, I'll bring healthier alternatives like the ones without artificial dyes, some of the candies that, you know, it's the same thing when we like go trick or treating, I replace, you know, the candies. When we go uh, to uh, the Easter egg hunt, I I replace the different candies for them. Um, And with the more, what I like to call the Dr. Organic Mommy approved candies, you know? (laughs) Um, And so that way they're having that exposure, but they're not getting those artificial dyes. They're not getting all those preservatives and tons of, you know, refined sugars. They're getting the better alternative, but they're not being restricted. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. The Mindful Mama podcast is supported by Rasa, which is an amazing adaptogenic coffee alternative with an incredible selection of blends. Seriously, you need to try it. I am very aware of my caffeine intake because I want a good night's sleep. Sleep is incredibly important to me. And we have like caffeine stays in your body for so long after you have it. So I really don't want to have any caffeine after 11. And so I love, love using these energizing herbs and adaptogenics from Rasa after lunch. And it really is this like coffee alternative. It goes with my little piece of dark chocolate. It is so lovely and it does not make you jittery. And it's a great way to have, like I do, like with a coffee, you know, habit or as an alternative to coffee and have no caffeine at all. They offer 10 awesome blends like cacao, bold, calm, and welderberry. They even have an AIP friendly version of the original. And each blend is formulated by clinical herbalists and can support decreased stress, better sleep, and energy throughout the day. Plus, Rasa sustainably sources their ingredients and buys fair trade or direct trade. I love it. The calm, I had it as like, I made it strong like an espresso and it tastes so good. It really felt like it It met my need for coffee, but it like had a nice, I had a nice even energy and just brightness about my, you know, my alertness. It really was wonderful. I'm telling you, you have to try Rasa. They even have an online quiz so you can easily find the perfect blend just for you. And right now I have an awesome deal to get you started. 20% off your first purchase. Just go to wearerasa.com and use my special promo code HUNTER20. That's promo code HUNTER20 for 20% off at wearerasa.com. That's R-A-S-A. You promote, you promote like eating a great lifestyle as far as nutrition goes. Lots of veggies, clean meats. We want to, we want to eat organic, invest in organic veggies if we can, this is, this can be great. It can be wonderful for, for families, but you know, parents are cooking lots of different things, maybe trying to cut down on their meat consumption, doing lots of things. And then, but then you end up kids with kids who are picky eaters who don't, you know, they're like, mom, what are you making? This is not chicken 
I don't know, whatever <laughs> nuggets, and this is Chicken not nuggets. mac and cheese, and this is not. And I'm, I mean, I know at least for my own, my first daughter, she was as a young person, she was really just obsessed with, you know, I would give her like just whole wheat bunny crackers. She was obsessed with bunny crackers. And I was worried about her not eating too much. So I would, I would, you know, she would, she just ended up, she still really, really loves her, her bagels and her toasts and her, and her carbs. But what do we do with picky eaters and, and why do kids become such picky eaters and, and how can we work with that when we're trying to really up the nutrition in our household? Yeah. So first there's a few things I want to address. First thing, I actually don't like to use the word picky. Um, mm. even in, I don't want it even in anybody's vocabulary. Kids tend to be on a spectrum from cautious to adventurous, and then there's mm. everything in between. Mm -hmm. Kids who tend to be more cautious in their eating tend to be more cautious in other facets of their personality. You know, the kids who tend to be more cautious with trying new things, they might be more cautious when entering a new situation or more cautious about, say, getting into the water uh, whereas your more adventurous child who's like, oh, I want to try that. What is it? You'll see they'll be more adventurous in other forms of their life as well. And so the reason I don't actually like to use the word picky is because even if, you know, you're just thinking it, you're projecting it onto your kids. Well, it's a judgmental it's, word, you know, we're a very judgmental yeah. word and your kids internalize it, you know, and you can say, oh, my kid, my kid's not going to eat that. You're putting that judgment and that you know, thought onto your child and your child, child automatically going to internalize that thinking, okay, I'm not going to eat it. You know, my mom thinks I shouldn't eat it. My dad thinks I shouldn't eat it. I, I'm not going to do that. And so I just really like to remove that from the vocabulary. The other thing you pointed out is, well, I'm worried about my kids not getting enough food. So unless your child has a medical condition, most children are very well aware of figuring out, okay, I'm not hungry. I'm hungry. I know when I need to eat. Um, I might not be hungry at this meal, I'll be hungry at the next meal. And so I like to look at a two week period. If your children aren't eating anything in two weeks, take them to see your physician. Um, but there's ups and downs. Like there might be a day where I don't feel like eating avocado today, you know, and all of a sudden it's just out of the blue. And you're like, well, my child used to love avocado. They, their taste buds change and that's all right. So I like to stick with something from the Ellen Satter Institute where she talks about you as the parent or caregiver decide what and when your child eats. The child decides if and how much they eat. Mm. And so that really removes that tension, that battle of control of like, oh, I need to make sure you're eating. Like you have to eat all this one more bite. I want to remove that sentence from everybody's vocabulary as well. Never say, let's eat one more bite or try this or when you eat this, then you, then you can have that mm. um, because it just creates so much tension with food and that actually sets them up for failure in the long run as a teenager, as a tween, as a teenager and as an adult because they'll have this battle with food thinking like, oh, if I don't eat this, then I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to feel this or I'm not going to look this way or whatever it may be. And so you want to set them up to have a successful, a successful relationship with food. And as far mm. as like, well... I can't always make food at home or, you know, I can't always make the, you know, amazingly nutritious food. My motto is 80-20. And it's a general concept of whatever I can control at home, great. You know, whatever's in my control, great. When I can't, I let go. Because if you can try to control everything, this is where I say social toxins can actually be worse than chemical toxins. You know, mm. those social toxins of constantly worrying about everything, being overwhelmed, that stress can lead to increases in cortisol, which actually can increase, uh, can hurt your immune system. And so you want to try and avoid that and say, I'm just going to let it go. We're at a restaurant. This is the best we can do. Nothing's organic. I don't know what the kids are eating. Let it go, you know, but what I, when I can control it, I do. Hmm. It's hard for people to let that go. You know, it's hard for people to hold things lightly. You know, you're practicing, you're saying like, hold, care about this, but hold it lightly. And, and that can be, that can balance. be tough. I mean, balance in general in life is hard. I mean, everybody has difficulty with balance. So do I. Yeah. 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 We only know we're out of balance when we're out of balance. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So talk to us about 
Um, well, actually, there was one thing I wanted to thinking about the control of eating. One thing that I we did in our household that I thought was very helpful thinking about how kids are naturally not interested in, um, bitter foods, like the things that have bitterness in it, like broccoli and things like that. We have to kind of develop a palate for a lot of different foods, right? No one likes coffee when they first drink it, but now we I mean 90% of the world <laughs> loves coffee. Right. Um, so, um, we did like, a we tried to do, you know, a, uh, you don't have to eat it, but you must taste it. And we told them why, like, because this, you know, we are, we don't like a lot of things when we first eat it and is how we develop a palette of foods and things like that. So just, you can taste, take a little bite. You can totally spit it out, but just taste it. Yeah. That was kind of the. It's a, it's a great rule of thumb. What I like to explain to them is you may not actually like it today, but you may yeah. like it tomorrow. Your taste buds are changing. And I actually get out, you know, our, I have our, all of us pull out our tongues and we examine them and I have them get out a little <laughs> magnifying glass and I tell them like, do you know what's all those little bubbles on your tongue and those little bumps? Those are taste buds. And actually there's different sections of your tongue and they taste different things, you know, and they're mm. more, you know, intense in different areas of your tongue. And so we talk about that. So yes, that's a great thing to do. There's a difference between saying you have to eat this, you know, mm. unless you eat this, then you can't have this, mm -hmm. you know, and battling with them versus let's try this food. You never know if you're going to like it today. You may not like it and that's all right. And giving them that out takes away that pressure. You may not like it today, but you may like it. You never know. And so we always try everything. And so that is a great um, thing to stand by. All right. Great. Great. Okay. Family meals. I know I have, I mean, I have a, a couple of friends who end up like, um, because their, their kids would eat some things and the parents wanted to eat some different things. So they end up like Maybe with short order chef. <laughs> yeah. Or they end up making like one meal for the kids at a certain time. And then they put their kids to bed and then they have their own adult meal. And while I can totally understand why you don't want to do that. Cause sometimes it's like absolute insanity to eat with small kids. I, I worry about that. What do you think about family meals? Uh, family meals, there's, it's so important a, to just sit with each other and have a family meal. Like there's tons of research on that, that, you know, kids are more likely to finish high school. Kids are more likely to have a group of friends when you actually sit and have family meals. That's where discussions mm -hmm. happen. That's where you share things. That's where you process your day. You know, when you pick up your kids from school, they never want to talk. They talk at the dinner table or they talk right before they go to bed. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it's not a stalling technique. It's that's, that's how they process and have closure to their day. Uh, so family meals, A, are very important. So I always recommend sitting with your kids and not just standing up or being around a TV or anything like that. You sit around and have a meal. And I also like to set the table. You not, may not be able to do this every day. You may be able to do it on the weekends, but that's fine. Setting the table, presentation matters. You know, when you go to a restaurant, you enjoy the atmosphere and that makes the meal more inviting and more enjoyable. And that's true for kids too. Don't think that, you know, they don't notice those things. So having them have placemats. I like to have a drawer that's low down to the floor where little ones can actually access their plates, have their placemats, have their, you know, reusable napkins, their silverware, where they go and set the table, even getting like a glass jar and picking some flowers before dinner, mm. putting those in, it just makes it more inviting. And so once you make that table more inviting, it actually invites the children more to the table. It makes them easy. It makes it easier to actually get the kids to the table because that's another hard part, getting the kids to come to di sit down for dinner. Um, another thing I like to do is buffet style where it's all shared plates and everybody's serving themselves. You know, when they're younger, you know, as they get into a, like preschool, kindergarten, you want them to start to serve themselves so they can start to learn portion sizes, not for dieting. So get that out here, mind. It's really for them to learn, all right, this is what I'm going to start with, and I'm going to make sure to eat the food that I'm putting on my plate so we don't waste food. So I'm teaching kids about sustainability and wasting food, and, you know, we don't want to do that. And so that's the important part of buffet style with meals. And then they also get to pick and choose. And so you, it's fun to put everything on the side and kind of deconstruct things because they can make up their own mind. They feel like there's more independence there. They're more willing to try it. They see the influence of siblings or cousins or whoever is at the table, which makes a difference. My mm -hmm. other key thing with family meals, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as dessert. 
I'm not a big dessert person anyways. Um, my husband is. So uh, how do we balance that? We always serve fruit with the meal. Um, you may be thinking, well, why are we serving fruit? My kid's only going to eat the fruit. So that's usually the first question I get. It takes the mystery away because you're thinking as a child, oh, well, I have to eat all this broccoli, but if I don't eat it, then I can't get my fruit. But fruit is more, fruit is better. Fruit is sweeter. It's it's more mysterious or the dessert is more mysterious. I want to have that. So I recommend getting rid of like the treat, the special thing that we serve at the end of the meal and having it with the meal. Mm. And it's also about portion size again, because you're might be thinking, well, my child's only going to eat the blueberries and they're going to just keep asking for blueberries. Everybody gets one scoop of everything on their plate. And once they are done with that, portion. So say they finish their blueberries first. Oh, I see lots of other foods on your plate. You have to eat lots of different kinds of foods to help your body grow. When you're done with those foods, if you're still hungry, you may have some more blueberries. Mm. And so that's the kind of language because language is so key, especially with younger kids um, to really help them understand and pay attention to their body and pay attention to what foods help us grow and what foods don't help us grow. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcasts right after this break. I really care about what I put on in my skin and in my body. That's why I'm so thrilled that Thrive Cosmetics is a sponsor of the Mindful Mama podcast. They have high performance beauty and skincare products made with clean skin loving ingredients. They have no parabens, no sulfates, no phthalates. They're certified 100% vegan and cruelty free and cause is in the name for a reason because every purchase supports organizations that help women thrive. So I love, love, love Thrive Cosmetics because they have amazing products that work really, really well and that are good for you and they're good for the world. It's win, win, win. I am totally obsessed with the Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara. I will never use anything ever, ever again. Seriously, this is an amazing product. It has more than 15,000 five-star reviews. It is ultra lengthening, eye-opening mascara. It lasts all day. It doesn't clump. It doesn't smudge. It doesn't flake. It really looks like you have lash extensions without glue or expensive prices. It's really has clean, nourishing ingredients, and it helps your lashes actually look better over time. It's easy to remove. It has this like tubing formula. It slides right off with warm water and a washcloth. Like you don't even have to use soap. I'm obsessed. You have to get the Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara. It's so, so, so much better than anything else I've ever, ever tried. And another one that I'm obsessed with is their Brilliant Eye Brightener. I love, I have this like Aurora, which is like this rose gold, gold color. I put it in the corner of my eye. It just makes me look awake and good. It's so, so helpful. It, it really makes uh, this lightener just makes, it gives your eye this lift. It makes you look like you've had plenty of sleep, even if you haven't. Honestly, it is wonderful. It, it really gives this perfect wash of color and glow. And it has 13 amazing shimmering shades. So I really like Muna and Aurora. Those are my favorite. And now Thrive has a defying gravity eye lifting cream, which instantly lifts, tightens, and brightens skin around the eyes with line smoothing hydration. It softens your skin. It smooths it. It deeply moisturizes it. And it really just instantly reduces dark circles and puffiness. So it is really like beauty sleep in a bottle. It's the defying gravity eye lifting cream. Now the products are amazing, but Thrive Cosmetics is so great because of the bigger than beauty mission for every product purchase. Thrive Cosmetics donates to help women thrive who are women emerging from homelessness, surviving domestic abuse, fighting cancer, and more. So there's no better time. Now is a great time to try Thrive Cosmetics for yourself. And right now you can get 15% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com slash hunter. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S.com slash hunter for 15% off your first order. Oh, I love that. There's a lot in there that you that you mentioned. I, I want to kind of go back to the idea of what you were saying about presentation. And I think that's so true. Like this idea of 
um, you know, that's something they that they talk about a lot, a lot in the Montessori method, right? It's like the presentation of objects and learning objects and and have it, and how that big impact of environment and making things inviting can really make things work. I mean, you know, you mentioned, I love buffet style of the idea of setting the table and the placemats and, you know, we have our own napkin rings in our house. And um, one thing that we, I noticed when, um, when we were doing some uh, green chef meals is like, they teach you how to like do these, like, uh, they're like here, they, they, they make you, they have you plate the food. Right. Yeah. And my daughter would make the meal and she would be, she would plate the food and everyone would be like, Oh, it's so pretty on the plate. Cause it's, you know, it's like, here, follow this picture. And this is in the middle and this is, you know, and everyone was like, Ooh, and all of a sudden we're eating all these exciting things. Cause it looks so pretty, like in a restaurant, you know, yeah. and that was another kind of way. So, so kind of what I'm getting from like, thinking of that and thinking of the the buffet and the net you know the placemats and all that is like just this idea of the importance of the environment the aesthetic appeal etc it's not you know it's not just about um this food, food. It's, it's about it's about food. all the senses for sure and there's Savoring. a lot of psychology behind that when you bring up plates this is also why i don't like colorful plates or plates with characters on them because it distracts away from the food. This is why, you know, when you look at like chefs, they always want a white plate because it's a mm. clear, plain canvas. And it's true for kids too. They want to see their food. Let the food speak for themselves. Don't try to distract with having like a fun plate with like a map or, you know, whatever the child's into or interested in, you know, or curious about. Let them be curious about the food, not mm. the actual plate. And then another thing about that with presentation. Um, with regards to psychology is the amount of food, especially when you're looking at really little ones when, you know, like they're one, you know, about one or when they're starting off eating their on their solid journey, you don't want to put too much on their plate. When you overwhelm a child with too much food before they're serving themselves, it can be very overwhelming. You want your child to learn to pay attention to their body. And this is how they start. Let them ask for more and say, I'm still hungry you know, mm. and you can actually play around with the plate size, make it a smaller plate if they feel like, oh, they don't have enough of food on their plate. So it's trial and error, you know, do a smaller plate. So it looked like there's enough more food on their plate, but there's not actually as much food on the plate. And so there's a lot of psychology with all of that going on. So you really just have to pay attention to what works with your children. So now that my kids are getting older, <laughs> um, they, you know, when we were younger, we didn't do anything on the weeknights except, you know, have dinner and do bedtime and that whole right. thing. But now um, I have one daughter who wants to swim. I have the other daughter who's volunteering at the horse barn, mucking stalls. And so we're going out and, you know, and, and picking them up at like 730 right. at night and coming back home. And, and my husband was a little, he's, you know, he has his, he has his own issues and concerns with food because he has, uh, issues with gluten intolerance and things like that and digestion. Right. Um, and so he was, he was thinking that, well, we would eat earlier and they would do their thing, but the girls wanted to eat when they came home. Yeah. And so now we're eating dinner at like eight o'clock at night. And I feel good about that because we're still having this family dinner, this moment to decompress, right. this moment to gather. And that feels really, really good. So what do you think in this idea, like, as far as like development, like, you know, what's more important, these extracurricular activities that may be at nighttime or family dinners, or should we, you know, you know, find a way to do both. If we can't, what wins? <laughs> I think that's a great question. You know, especially as kids start to get more scheduled and have more activities as they get older the activities are important. You know, you obviously don't want to overschedule your child and you want to pay attention to what your child wants to do versus, you know, knowing if it's too much for them and seeing how it's impacting, you know, their social life, their, their schooling, you know, how they handle everything around them. Um, so that's important to, to look at first. Second, um, yeah, you still want to have those family dinners. So I applaud you for still having, <laughs> you know, you still have them at night, you know, it's 7.30, eight o'clock at night when you sit down, it might be, you know, a little bit faster of a meal. Um, yeah. but at least you're still sitting down and you're having those conversations. The family meal is so important to have those conversations. 
because that's when your kids divulge things to you. They let you into their life because it's the end of the day and they're more willing to let you in. So I do Mm -hmm. think if you can try to squeeze those family meals in, very important. If you're not going to do them on Friday or Saturday because they've got activities, make sure to do it on Sunday. You know, Mm -hmm. so trying to at least pick at least once, if not more, a week where you're really sitting down and having those nice family meals where you're all getting together. And even if you can't do it at night, a brunch where you're sitting down with your older kids, you know, they might not want to hang out with you (laughs) early in the morning, like at 10 o'clock. So, you know, you play around with it. Um, But finding, finding those times to sit together as a, as a family. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I think it's, it it is that too. Like they are, that is what's happening. You know, it's at the end of the day, there's that sharing, there's that connection and that, that is what's happening. I think it's, it's so incredibly important. Like there's that nutritional value, but there's that all that. So, so much other, there's so many things I could ask you about Natasha. There's so many things we didn't talk about. I'm sure as far as, um, as far as nutrition for kids, goes, what are some things we miss that we should, we should have, we should have been able to, to cover some things you want to mention that I think that are, that are important for people to be considering when they're, they're, they're thinking about nutrition for themselves and their kids. Uh, exposing your kids to a wide variety of foods. If you have local farmer's markets, taking them to the farmer's market. If you don't take them to the grocery store, let them be excited about picking you know, a fruit or a vegetable from the produce section and you can figure out, okay, where does it come from? How does it grow? What are the different ways we can cook it up? How should we try to do it? Let's do it together. Getting them involved in the kitchen, you know, getting them involved in that cooking process. That's really important. You know, if they, kids tend to take more ownership and get more excited and take more pride in their food when they're actually making it. I have my kids in the kitchen starting from the time they're one years old and like teaching them different knife skills. And I have I even have a post on it coming up um, about the progression of knives that you actually use mm. with your children. So did you get the wavy cutter, the one with the yep. bit you grab with the you hands? Grab, yep. My my two-year-old uh was is using that. And then she'll progress to the uh more um uh star knife and then it, it keeps going from there. And my seven-year-old is now using a paring knife. And mm. so you just you get them involved in the kitchen, it makes it a lot better changing your atmosphere where you actually are eating. That can be another way of, you know, handling a child who tends to be more cautious. All right, let's try a picnic today. Let's Mm. introduce new foods during lunchtime. So it takes the pressure off of parent and caregiver that, well, I'm feeling like my child's not going to eat. What do I do? Well, don't mind if they don't eat lunch because at least I know there's afternoon snack and dinner time, you know, Um, having a trunk picnic or even an inside picnic if it's cold outside, you know, making it a little bit more fun and changing it up uh, makes a big difference for kids. And that's really about presentation. We did um, one night we did eat like a pirate night (laughs) and we put a newspaper out on the table and I think I had like chicken legs (laughs) and it's funny because we reflect on it now and they're like, we didn't like, actually, we didn't actually like, we like a pirate night, <laughs> but it was fun at but the time. But it's something they remember, you know? Yeah, they totally it, remember it. They totally remember it. You know? <laughs> and so I think having those moments that's exactly right is so important for your kids. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. So I wish I could remember all the things that I, I, all the questions I wanted to ask when they were like six on this, but I can't, I'm sorry, dear listener, you're going to have to write into me and, and, and say, Hunter, you should have asked Natasha this, this, and this, or you'll just go to, go to Natasha. She has an amazing Instagram account where she has all kinds of like great ideas and tips and menu ideas and things like that. Uh, Do you want to share your, your handle here and and where people can find you? at sign dr doctor abbreviated period organic mommy and as you said i've got like a lunchbox menu that tells you exactly what to put into your lunchbox and gives you all gives you all the examples i have tons of recipes tons of ideas and ways of handling getting your kids um, to enjoy eating food you know and the language they use as the language is so important and then my website is drorganicmommy.com and i have all my free guides there as well all the proceeds from my page go to charity. Um, and I list out all the charities that we, um, contribute to. That's so cool. That's such a, a wonderful, it's, it's like a, a labor of love for you then. It very much is. I love what, I love what I do and I'm very fortunate <laughs> to do it. 
Wonderful. Well, I will let you go. Hopefully take take your nap. Are you napping? Do you nap during your pregnancy? Lots of naps. <laughs> I literally took a cat nap right before this. That's amazing. Cause I know it's morning time where you are. <laughs> you gotta get in your naps when you're pregnant. <laughs> yeah. You got to sleep where you can. <laughs> um, well, good. Um, congratulations. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your approach with us, your inspiration. I know I'll probably go home, uh, more inspired to, to, to bring more nutrients into my meals and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of like, I oh gosh, like what's on hand. I should, I, now I want to kind of stock up on my like easy things on hand, get those like oh, green my, peas. It's all about the veggie the loaded oatmeal for the morning. That's what yes. I love doing. You know, yeah, loading yeah, up yeah. your oatmeal with like grated zucchini, grated carrots. Oh, it's wow. It's a natural sweetener. It's like, I call it like the kids, like, you know, um, natural food, natural, you know, colored foods. Uh, and oh. it's like there's sprinkles to the kids and it adds a natural sweetness. You don't even taste the zucchini. Oh, I'm going to try that with the, yeah. the carrots for my oldest daughter. Cause she's and have like a topping me. bar too. Cause then they get to actually put in all the fun, you know, cheese. Yeah. Yeah. We're really into like OG berries, the freeze dried strawberries right now, freeze dried strawberries. Those are great. Yeah. And it actually changes the color of the milk. Um, if you put in like wild frozen uh, blueberries makes it purple milk naturally. Mm -hmm. So all these, all these great ideas with my second daughter, I used to make like green smoothies and I would take a bottle for the breast milk and I would like cut the nipple off the top of the bottle. So it was thick opening and she would just be like, just drinking chug it these. Down. she would Love be it. chugging this green smoothie. I don't know if it made her, she does, does do like green smoothies still, but she, she really does like her sweets too. And I'm like, Oh, do I like make her make my smoothies too sweet? Is it me? But yeah, whatever. There's nothing I can do about it at this point. <laughs> and you can always change, you know. I mean, I used to have a terrible diet as a kid. Um, oh yeah. Honestly, I ate ta Del Taco. I ate so much candy, and you know, you can, you have to detox from it, and you can. It's true. I was very candy addicted for a lot of my adult life. Very, very, very sugar addicted, and and I'm not anymore. And I don't even order dessert at restaurants anymore, which would be shocking to my younger self. You don't crave it, but you have to yeah. detox yourself from it. And you can do it as a family too, which makes it more of a fun activity to see, you know, make it more of a competition, especially Ooh. with the older ones. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> my, my angle from the older ones on the detox on the sugar is like, well, sugar is an inflammatory thing that and inflammation like adds to the pimples. <laughs> so no, the pimples. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that that is one way to get the kids to be a little bit more interested is if it's going to affect the appearance of their face for sure. Yes. Yes. That's, that's one aspect to remind them of. <laughs> well, Natasha, it's been so fun to talk to you. Obviously there's a lot more to say, go check out what, uh, Natasha's doing with Dr. Organic mommy at the, her site and on Instagram. And, um, it's been such a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on and doing the work you do and, and sharing your insights with everybody. It's, it's so helpful. Thank you so much for having me on. I had a blast. All right. I'm feeling resolved. I'm feeling more, uh, more excited to, to feed more nutritious meals to my kids and get those nutrients in. I mean, for us, especially in Delaware in the winter, you know, I feel like there's so little light and sunshine, like it just even becomes more important. So I'm going to be some nice tips and tricks. So if you are, let me know, take a screenshot of you listening to this, share it on your Instagram stories and tag me at mindful mama mentor. Let me know what you're getting out of this. I hope it's been helpful to hear all of this. Uh, great, great resource from Dr. Natasha Beck. I'm so excited. Next week, we are going to be talking about the final episode in our resolution series, Resolve to Declutter, Krista Lockwood, and we're going to talk all about the nuts and bolts of decluttering. So make sure you're subscribed, hit that subscribe button, and I will see you then. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for listening from the bottom of my heart to yours. I'm so glad we get to do this podcast and share with you and make this connection. I really hope it impacts your life positively. Remember, if it makes an impact for you, go leave that Apple podcast review. It makes such a big difference. And now I'm just wishing you a great week, my friend. I'm wishing you some peace, some ease, 
some connection and snuggles and all the good things in life. And I'm wishing you the presence of mind to be able to be here for it, right? To be here for this wild, precious journey we have that is not guaranteed, right? Let, let's appreciate it today, here and now. Um, so thank you for being here. I can't wait to talk to you again. Namaste. They definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them. And, not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I had this. You can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You'll be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. This isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list. So you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside mindfulparentingcourse.com.